Hi, everyone. Great to be here. I want to start my talk, um, and it's about big data. I want to talk to you about this idea that, uh, that in a world of big data, um, it might be becoming more difficult for us to let go, right? So how difficult is it to let go? <laughs> so letting yourself go, like I'm, not, I'm doing now. Letting yourself go is becoming more difficult, I think. And I want to ask you a question. What was the last time that you really let go? It might be when you were a student, right, and you had a big party. You were exploring, you were traveling. And it's a time, especially for me, where you break your own rules, right? You explore new things, try new things. And not only that, you break society's rules. You might try something that's not exactly legal or, you know, you all know what I'm talking about. We all do this. And um, something is changing, though. And I want to mention this quote from the New York Times that I read in 2012. Mia here is a student. She's saying, well, we're becoming more reserved. Um, you don't want to have to defend yourself later, so you don't do it. And what's she talking about? She's talking about getting drunk, partying, traveling, doing wild things, because she's worried that it'll be on social media the next day, that her friends will post it on Instagram, Facebook. So her life, she's, you know, she's becoming more, she's starting to think like, can I do this? Is, will this affect me later on? And I want to argue that this is happening to all of us, right? It's happening to all of us, but also it's happening in a more subtle way than you might realize. And that's because of the rise of big data. Big data is starting to create pictures of us, of our lives, uh, in a way, just like a camera would on your smartphone when you post it to Facebook. Just like that, big data is creating pictures of your life. And it happens every time you click one of these buttons. Again, you give more and more information about yourself, about your activity, about your behavior. And for me, I think this is one of my heroes, Edward Snowden, because he made it very visible to us that this is going on. Right? That that's, there are big corporations and big organizations that are gathering all the data that we are sharing and that are now putting that together and creating detailed pictures of our lives. And he made it more, more easy to talk about these things, and that, that, I like that, but it's also important for the, uh, the where I work, set up. We're a media lab, and we try to make society understand the issues surrounding technology. Because oftentimes we think of technology as something that's perfect and great, and sometimes you know, we think, oh, it's going to be horrible, and let's not do this. But it's very rare that we create really nuanced understanding, right, and really go in depth. Too often we think technology, nah, not my thing, but I really think that we should understand it better. So I'll give you an example of what we do. Uh, in 2015, we launched a media campaign called Everyone's a Spy. And the campaign um, tried to make the point that we are now all becoming spies of each other, just with, like we saw with, with Mia. It's uh, the idea that there's no longer security cameras are watching us, but it's also each other. Uh, and this was a media campaign that was all over Holland with videos like this one uh, with Je by Jeffrey Lillemon, and posters like this were all over Holland. They kind of kind of give like a dark edge of social media, the dark edge of the internet kind of gave, gave visual appeal to that. And this was the project within that, that campaign that got the most attention. This was called Copy Copy. It was a website that sold mugs with children's pictures on them. I have one here. And these pictures, the, the fun thing is these pictures came from you, from Flickr, where a lot of parents put the pictures of their children online. Um, and often with, by giving it a license that allows commercial reuse without probably realizing it. So we put those pictures on these mugs and tried selling them, or Dimitri Tukmetsis and uh, Yuri Veerman did. And it got so much attention, right? Because it, it reaches close to you. It's about your life and your children, and you start to realize that it's the impact that it could have. It reached CNN. So it's an example of how we try to reach society about these issues and try to make it understandable. But today I'm here to talk about our latest project. It's called the National Birthday Calendar. It's a service, or a startup you could say, and what it does is it uh, gathers basically all your data. It's a database of all Dutch people. So we gather your name, your address, your date of birth, but not only that, we go further than that. We want to know everything about you that we can for the simple reason that we will then be able to advise everyone in Holland on what birthday presents you get for you, <laughs> right? No more unwanted presents. It'll, it'll be perfect. So doesn't that sound like a great idea? All you have to do is give us all your information. Um, so then we will finally be able to find out who actually likes soap as a birthday present. I've heard those people exist. 
And it might also be a chance to find out who likes, you know, a nice necklace. <laughs> so, what we did was we got together with a group of, of uh, technologists, data experts, and we started thinking, like, what kind of data sources could we find online already? And I'm sure a lot of you are a member of these, things like uh, Hives, you probably forgot is it, but it's still there, uh, Scholbank, etc. all kinds of services that you were once a member of or that you are in, and we tried to get as much as possible within legal boundaries, kind of. Um, so it's, basically, it's, we're making a puzzle with 16 million piece, pieces. Right? How difficult that can that be? So we try to find out. So this is what it looks like. We get together and we put up some, some birthday stuff and eat birthday cake and find out everything about you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a lot of fun. And it's, it's also kind of a scary because we were already expecting to find a lot of, of, of dirt. Right? We, we, we kind of, as geeks, we kind of knew there would be a lot of stuff. But we were surprised at how much we could find and how easy it was. So we can find like Excel sheets of, uh, of all the uh, uh, some, some, some uh, uh, cities in Holland put out online Excel sheets with all the data, dates of birth and names of newborn children. So it's like, oh, thank you. Um, and we find, of course, people like Ronald Plostek in there. But I know what the question is on your mind. You want to know, am I in there? So let's do a little experiment. Who would like to try to find out what we know about you? Who would like to be a volunteer? You, sir, can I ask you? Right. I'm going to call my colleague Jelle. Jelle, are you there? Jelle? I can hear you, but not very well, but let's, let's go for it. Yeah. So, Jelle, someone here. Sir, what's your name? Martin. You're looking for Martin Zijnstra. Yeah. Is it a quicker or longer A? Oh, sorry, it's in English, Jelle. Is it a long or short A? I'm getting quite garbled collection right now. So. Sorry? Is hey. it better like this? Hello, hello? Better. you hear Short me? One. No one's ever going to understand what we're talking about. Do you need to know anything more? Or have you found uh, it? If it's a quarter or a long eye, I need to know. It's it's quarter, eye. Uh, quarter eye. Okay. Well, let's see. Yeah. Uh, right off the bat, I can see the. It's a special one, the Zijnstra, because there are 577 Zijnstra's in the Netherlands. So hopefully we got one. So uh, For how many I are see there? The, so the 500 around uh, Zijnstra's in the Netherlands, but we got 280 of them. Well, it, it looks about uh, I, my age. Uh, I've got one Martin Zijnstra from 84, from Gambouder or Leeuwarden. 1984, yeah. In Utrecht, or uh, yeah. in the air. Utrecht, okay, yes. Anything else? Can we find out anything well, uh, about uh, where he lives? Uh, I've got... Uh, uh, so it's uh, Dombauer or Leeward, I've got... Uh, okay, maybe, not, say, this, maybe uh, not say all the details. Can you find out, um, you find out anything about his personality? Well, let me check, uh, check uh, Crystal for that. So, uh, I see with an accuracy of 81%. When, uh, you should, when you speak to Martin, you should words, use words like done, absolute C, and it's taken care of. So I should project boldness and confidence. And don't expect to lead the conversation. And don't take time under trust before you make your point. Okay. And when you send an email to him, you should state your purpose in the first sentence. And write it in three sentences or less. And don't add any essential stuff. A fancy like, like, hope you're doing well. Okay, thank so you, Jelle. Uh, Jelle, thanks. <laughs> I think we're going to uh, leave it there. So we found that I okay. should say words like absolutely. That might help for you. Thank you very uh, much. You're someone who likes uh, things to be clear. Very cool. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's continue with that. Um, thank you, Jelle. That's great. You might feel some emotion now. I, know, I, I start feeling emotion with this stuff. You might feel angry. But please don't shoot the messenger. Knowing a lot about you is becoming a huge market. And uh, uh, you probably have never heard of this company. Who here in this audience has heard of this company? <laughs> Almost no one, right? But this company is worth $20 billion. It's, at the moment, <laughs> in the current stock market, bigger than Twitter. It's exploded in the past couple of years, and you've never heard of it. It's the biggest startup ever. It's, uh, it's, what it does is it works for, for, for governments and companies, and it takes their data and combines them into a way that they can understand it. It offers a service. 
is huge. And you've never heard of it, and it's, but it's part of a market of data brokers. Companies that, that gather data, resell it, repackage it. Uh, companies that offer data enrichment services. So basically they're gathering everything and helping other organizations get also get a lot of data about you. And what these companies will tell you is that data is a new gold. Right? You've all heard this. I'm here to argue that it might be gold for them, but it might not be gold for you. Because a lot of, when people have a lot of data about you, when organizations do, it starts to change your behavior. It really does. They expect it to. So let's look at the European Union. Here we have this idea that um, you can get a, a discount if you give data. Like last year in, in, in the news, Achmea, uh, an insurance company, would give you a discount if you give them your exact location where you drive all the time. So that's interesting. Like, do you start thinking like, well, maybe Achmea is looking over my shoulder how I drive. Should I drive safer? We also see the rise of applicant tracking system. This is when you try to get a job. If you get a job, then they will take your resume and your letter and put it through a system that finds out, again, your probably your character, what kind of emotional person you are, uh, where you live, what your background is, everything. And they filter out the first part of it, because there's so many people applying nowadays for jobs. They filter out the first few just based on algorithms that depend, that decide, well, this person is probably a good match or not. The scariest thing we saw last year is, is, is people, I think. This is a, a service that, that asks you to rate your friends, rate the, rate the people around you, give them a rating. Tell them, uh, th the story is it'll give feedback to everyone and we'll all become better people. But of course, at the same time, it's a bit of a, a scary side to that when we all do that. So this stuff is powerful and not very transparent. And of course, that means that China got interested. Um, <laughs> so um, they are building a social credit system. And the idea here is that it will give a score to everyone in China on how good of a citizen they are. And uh, this is their story. When people's behavior isn't bound by their morality, a system must be used to restrict their actions. Right? So they don't trust that you are, are a moral person or that you can be. They will make a system to push you in the right direction. The system will be based on various criteria, ranging from financial credibility and criminal record to social media behavior. And there's a fun part. From 2020 onwards, each adult citizen should, besides its identity card, have such a credit code. So they're making it mandatory. And they're, already, they're not wasting any time. They're already building a first version. This is a Sesame credit system. And it's uh, already working. And already students and people are com com comparing scores with each other. And this is based on what you buy. And it's also already connected to the biggest dating website in China. So you can kind of find out what the other people uh, that you're starting to date, if their credit worthiness is, what they, you know, if they're a good citizen. So are you buying the right things becomes uh, a serious thing, a serious question. And also, if you have a good, good score, it might be easier to get a loan or a visa, right? It's all these type of things that are happening. What you see here, oh yeah, this is scary. This is one of the one that really gets me. Your friend score influences your score, right? So if you have a low score, you might drag down your friends, <laughs> right? And this is, I'm not joking, this is the idea. So, I mean, you've got to wonder when your, your startup scene is, is an inspiration for China. And what you see happening basically is a form of data discrimination, like a data stratification, where it's no longer about your skin color or your sex or your gender. It's about your data, about your behavior. It's about what you do. And it's being recorded you know, forever. So when you were 48 and you're trying to get a job, you might still be you know, dragged down by a bad score that you had when you were 18. Um, and of course, Sesame Credit will not diverge, divulge exactly how it calculates its credit scores, explaining that it's a complex algorithm. So again, you see this untransparency, this, this subtleness, the hiddenness of these systems. Um, so what I'd like to, to, to understand and take home for the first thing I want you to understand is data is not neutral, and these systems are not neutral. There's always someone who pays for them. There's always someone behind the knobs deciding the algorithm, deciding how it gets used, and that might not always be in your advantage. And data is, <laughs> please remember this, it's not the new gold. Stop saying that. It's not the new gold. Data is the new oil, right? Data's new oil. Because like oil, with oil we understand that there are bad sides and good sides, right? It's, it's a complex thing. But the first 50 years we kind of didn't realize it was bad, but now we do and now we're changing it. And I really hope that with big data, we'll, we'll become a bit more faster and start to realize that, that big data, like oil, has downsides and that we have to uh, understand those and really regulate them and, and, and ask for better systems. I think th the part that for me I'm really learning in all this is that you do have something to hide, right? It's not about 
being a terrorist. That's all nonsense. This is about the chances that you have in your life, the chances, chances that are given to you. Right? It's about equality in a way. And we have to really understand that. Too soon we say, well, I have nothing to hide. No, you do. <laughs> and it's about your life and your career and your children and all that. It's very day-to-day. -day. So for me, privacy is the right to be imperfect. Right? The right to not be a perfect citizen. The right to make mistakes. The right to not have everything remembered. Privacy, you could say, in the theme of the TEDx talk, is the right to let go. So we all understand that that's important to have. So I would like us to together work on creating a society where it's still okay to break your own rules, where we understand the value of that and we fight for that. Um, because otherwise, we might up end up with a society where you know, we're all more well-behaved, but perhaps we're all also a little bit less human. Thank you.